Good morning. Um, this is going to be a fairly brief session. Uh, it's 45 minutes. All right, so uh, it's, it's our delight and, and pleasure. Um, to my left is, to my left is, is uh, Shabina Khatri, she's the leader of Tomorrow. Uh, and she's a United States journalist um, currently based in, uh, in Doha, Qatar. My name is Mohammed Dahshan. I'm from Egypt. Um, I'm a government consultant and a writer. And we have the distinct pleasure of having with us today um, Rebel Asad, who is the founder and director um, of the Organization for Freedom and Democracy, sorry, for Democracy and Freedom in Syria. And he currently lives in, in Britain in exile since he's been a child. Um, now, this session, um, with your permission, will go as follows. It's a pretty brief session, it's 45 minutes. So it will begin by Shabina and myself asking questions um, to Rival, and then, hopefully, time allowing, we will take a couple of questions from the floor. Um, now, if, if I may start. Um, Rival, it's very good to have you here. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, Shabina and I were discussing what the first question should be, and we decided to outsource that to our friends in Syria. So we asked our friends, what should we ask Rebel al-Assad? And I must say, four out of every five questions had to do with, um, with, your father, Rifat, with the father of Rafat al-Assad and his, his alleged involvement in the um, massacres of Hama, which left tens of thousands of people dead in Syria, it had to do with, um, with your last name, etc. So I know that you, have, that you deny and that, that you, you are very keen on proving your father's innocence and that, and that's not my question. My question is this. How credible are you to people in Syria right now, if this is what their concern is when they first hear your name? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, um, you know, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, uh, be amongst uh, so many distinguished uh, leaders of the future and leaders of today, actually. Uh, first, I would like to, uh, to explain one thing and to make uh, one thing very clear. Uh, my father, yes, was part of the regime at that time. And, uh, but in the 70s, as a lot of people don't know, since the 70s, my father was the only person in Syria who was calling for uh, democracy. He had the Al Fursan magazine, uh, which used to talk about democracy in every edition, which used to talk about how important is democracy. Uh, and uh, he was not, again, I repeat, he was not part of uh, what happened in the Hama incidents, because my father at that time, uh, was uh, head of the higher education in Syria. Mm -hmm. He was head of the, a uh, lot of people, what they confuse with uh, uh, something, it used to be called the Unit 569, which job was the protection of Damascus in, 1980, uh, in 1982. As we all know, uh, 1982, there was the Israeli invasion of uh, Lebanon. And uh, the uh, Unit 569's responsibility, it used to act as a presidential guards because the presidential guards were not formed at, yet. They were only formed later in the late 1983, 1984. So, uh, and we also had, uh, as you know, uh, internal trouble with the Muslim Brotherhood, who were uh, uh, an extremist group who chose arms to go against the state and against the citizens. So it was very unwise, I think, for, my, uh, for uh, those, uh, these units who were acting as uh, uh, presidential guards to protect, and their job was to protect the capital, Damascus, to go 200 kilometers outside of uh, Damascus, uh, you know, uh, to, to Hama, uh, and leaving the capital while we were under threats from foreign enemies, which was Israel at the time, and we were also, uh, also had problems internally with the Muslim Brotherhood. But, but when you talk to people in Syria, when, when talk, people in Syria talk about you, are they capable of looking past your family ties? I mean, you, you are Bashar al-Assad's first cousin, and are people able to look past your family ties and, and listen to your message, or does that affect your credibility? No, m most people actually, a lot of people know that, that the regime at that time, when, when my father left Syria, they tried to blame everything on him. The regime entered into dialogue with the Muslim Brotherhood. And uh, they needed scapegoat, as Patrick Seal says, uh, you know, rightly in his book, he said they needed scapegoat, and they had to blame everything in the country on Rifat, because they didn't want him to stay in the country, they, uh, they had a certain agenda. They, wanted the, uh, they didn't want to move towards democracy and freedom. And uh, as you know, he was calling for uh, Syria to get away from uh, Iran. He was calling for Syria to, uh, to get away from the Soviet Union. And he was at that time seen as a traitor. And they, he was called a Western agent. And they had to get rid of him. And this is what happened in 1984 when they said, when there was a conspiracy saying that the president, uh, the late president, um, my uncle Hafez Assad, uh, was ill, which was not true. And 
they, I mean, they, they did all this uh, conspiracy to try to get rid of him, and they did, and he left the country since 1984, and as you can see, nothing has changed. This corruption is, is much higher today in Syria. There's a lot more economic problems in Syria. Uh, we have a, rise of, uh, a huge rise of extremism in Syria. And uh, you've seen how, I mean, how they've been acting lately. Uh, they've been, uh, they, they haven't shown any restraint you know, in, uh, in fighting against those, uh, those civilians, those uh, peaceful demonstrators. Uh, and this is exactly what, what it is. Okay. Um, I, I, we will go back to the, to the subject of Syria. We'd love to hear your thoughts on that. But let me take a, a wider view of the Middle East. I know you've been following the, the current events, um, and you've, you've commented uh, and written about that largely. Um, if we look at countries such as Tunisia and Egypt, where the dictator is down, the revolution seems to be over, we have a finish date, uh, but yet a lot remains to be done. Um, in your view, how can, we, how can we cement those gains that were acquired in those countries and avoid a backtrack to, 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 to dictatorship? How can we not fall back in old patterns, but maintain our, maintain our gains and, and move forward from that? I think the, the main important step was taken by the, the people, the free people of, of uh, the Arab world today. They were able to break the barrier of uh, fear, uh, and there's no way back. That's to make sure those people will never go back to the way they used to live before. They broke the, the, uh, you know, they broke the barrier of fear. They were able to get rid of their uh, dictators, and it's impossible. It could only go forward today. People today, everybody in the Middle East uh, has a satellite uh, uh, to live, everybody has satellite television, everybody has a mobile phone, every, a lot of people use internet, uh, maybe not in Syria, but all over the Middle East, everybody is, is connected, they, they're on the internet, they see what's happening around the world, they see how we live in Europe, how we live in the West, and in the East, and, uh, and it's impossible, they would not accept less than how uh, uh, the whole world is living today. So can we talk a little bit about the unstable countries then, with Libya, for example, and Yemen, how do you see those countries, the revolutions playing out there? Uh, in, uh, in Libya, as you know, the, it's very unfortunate because uh, it's, a, it's such a rich country with, uh, you know, a rich, a large country with very few populations. So the, uh, the leader, Gaddafi, had, you know, was able or could have uh, avoided all of that by just making his people live better. And uh, what's happening today is really unacceptable. It's, uh, you know, it's appalling that you, you have somebody who's just uh, grabbing to, to, to power, uh, you know, who just doesn't want to, you know, get, you know he, he doesn't want to leave, and he's ready to get rid of all these people just for him to stay in power. So what do you predict will happen then? <clears throat> well, I think uh, the international community has to stand very strong with those, uh, you know, with the people of Lib Libya to help them get their freedom, because just by the way, uh, with what's happening today, I think it's going to be very difficult. Uh, the people, uh, the citizens of Libya are, are very badly armed, very badly trained. Uh, it's such a large country, so they cannot mobilize so easily. And, uh, and as you've seen, uh, Gaddafi has a lot of money. Uh, he, has a, you know, he, he's, he was able to bring a lot of mercenaries from Africa and other places to uh, kill his own people. So the international community has to take a stronger step and uh, uh, you know, um, help the, the Libyan people in every way possible. So, so with regards to that, I live in Qatar, um, and it's been very interesting to see how involved Qatar has become in the, the Libyan revolution and in some of the other revolutions uh, during the Arab Spring. So would you, do you see more Arab countries getting involved? Should more Arab countries get involved in these Arab, Arab revolutions? I mean... Um, some countries, yes, sh should get involved, but uh, of course we want the democratic, uh, or the, con the countries that were able to get, you know, to, to this stage, to break through, to get involved, like Egypt and Tunisia. But of course we're not going to act, uh, we're not going to ask uh, dictator uh, countries to come and help, you know, or intervene in, in, in other countries. That, was, that would be the complete nonsense. Uh, for example, in, uh, in Yemen, uh, as you've seen what's happening, you know, yeah, I'm sure that uh, uh, Iran has, has a hand in it. Uh, again, in Bahrain, uh, I'm sure also that Iran also has a hand in it. Everybody wants to change in those countries, but we don't want also that we have, uh, uh, you know, to fall into the trap of uh, the, Iran uh, the Iranian regime, who just uh, using whatever is happening for their own, uh, so that they would get more power in the in the Middle East and in the area. Okay, and then going back to Syria, how involved do you think Arab 
nation should be in, in helping the people of Syria with their revolution. So, for example, would you condone NATO putting airstrikes or, or Arab countries sending fighter jets to Damascus? Of course, no, nobody is with uh, the use of, uh, you know, uh, uh, violence against your own people. You know, I, I would not suggest that and I would, uh, would ha we have to stay away from, from that because that would be very dangerous for, uh, for Syria and Syria uh, uh, is uh, in a very, a very delicate uh, situation. As you know, uh, uh, through Syria, uh, Iran controls uh, Lebanon, they control uh, Gaza, they control part of Iraq. So. Uh, Anything that could go wrong with Syria, I think uh, it could be a real disaster for the whole region because the Syrian regime is ready uh, at any time to ask for the Iranians' help. As you know, the, a lot of people in the Syrian regime who are uh, you know, from the uh, Syrian secret services and uh, security apparatus are trying uh, to get Syria, to uh, drag Syria into a civil war or into sectarian war, actually. Because if there is a sectarian war in Syria, they know that they can get uh, the chance to, uh, to ask Iran for help. They could ask uh, Hezbollah for help. Uh, they could ask uh, a lot of uh, Shia groups in, uh, in Iraq and other places uh, for help. And this would uh, put the whole region on fire. And this is what we don't want to see, actually. We have to be very careful about it. The Syrian people will be able to get their, uh, uh, their freedom uh, at the end. We ha they have to continue to go out. Uh, chanting for freedom, democracy, it has to be peaceful. Uh, they cannot uh, also fall into the secret uh, services trap. Uh, at the same time, we don't want to, uh, uh, you know, there are in Syria some extremist groups that also would like to drag Syria into sectarian war because in that case they are able to, uh, you know, to use the sectarian card or think they could get help from other uh, countries in the region. Uh, and that also would be disastrous because, as you know, in Syria there's a lot of minorities. Uh, there are uh, Christians, uh, uh, you know, uh, Muslims, and between the Muslims you have Alawites, Sunnis, Shias, uh, Ismailis, Druze. Uh, you also have the Kurds, uh, you have the Armenians, uh, you have Sharkas, Turkmen, and all those people, uh, they would not feel safe if they feel that there, there is any extremist power that is trying to take uh, advantage of the situation for, to try to bring, for example, the Muslim Brotherhood or other extremist group into power. So they will defend themselves and that would crea create, uh, again, you know, a ca chaos inside in Syria. I, I, I will go back to the Syria-Iran link because I think it's a very interesting topic. Um, but I want to take you back to, to an answer that you said earlier when you talk about other countries' involvement and he said, well, not dictatorships, but countries that have achieved level of democracy, and you mentioned, well, Tunisia and Egypt. Well, how do, how do you think that countries like Tunisia and Egypt could, or perhaps even Lebanon as, a, as one of the more stable, more democratic regimes in the region, uh, per se, uh, how do you think these countries could be of, of assistance to the, uh, to the uprising in, in Syria? I mean, all those countries, they should denounce the violence that's used against, uh, the, you know, against those peaceful demonstrators. That's the most important thing to do. They should denounce it and they should uh, say it openly. They should not be shy about it. And uh, unlike what, for example, as soon as uh, uh, you know, um, you know, Mubarak was gone, you had uh, the head of the army who went, into, uh, who went to Syria and, had, uh, visited the, you know, and visited the president or the leadership in Syria. Uh, well, this was, I don't think this was a very good message uh, to the Syrian people who are demonstrating. The, Syri the Syrian people need to see international support, need to see that their uh, voice are heard, need to see, b because of the media, because we don't have, uh, the media is not allowed into Syria, mm -hmm. and because of uh, the limited uh, internet access, even though a lot of people uh, were able to put a lot of videos of the violence that was used against them, uh, but they need to see that uh, those countries are speaking up uh, for them and they are supporting them in every way possible. But besides speaking up, do you think that, I mean, I'm really thinking out loud here, but is logistic support to the revolutionaries in Syria as was done for the revolutionaries in, in, in Libya? I mean, I, I, I reside in Cairo, and a lot of that goes through Egypt, so I get to see how that looks like. But so that logistic, financial support, etc., uh, to rebels in Syria, do you think that would be a good idea, or would that only make the problem worse? No, that would be, very, that would be extremely bad, because you just use the, say, the word rebels. People are not... Uh, those people are, the yes, they're, they're revolutionaries, the but we, they should not be given, as I said, they should not be given arms. As, as soon as you give them arms, you are giving uh, legitimacy to, to the regime to fight back. 
You know, so, uh, and as long as people could go in the street peacefully and demonstrate, and we are able to, to show the world how badly the Syrian regime is treating the, the, those people, then the regime would lose its legitimacy and will finally uh, be isolated. But and as you've seen, there were sanctions lately by the European uh, Union, yeah. which I welcome, you know, against uh, uh, Syrian officials and by the United States of America. Mm -hmm. uh, and those, uh, the regime would not be able to uh, hold this pressure very long. This is why they, they would like to move uh, to, to see, uh, you know, an armed rebellion or any other thing so that they would get legitimacy to fight back. But do you think that people can hold out uh, longer than the regime? I mean, they've detained thousands of people, they've killed, I don't even know what the death toll is now. I mean, can they just keep going out in the street with no weapons, no protection, and, and chanting? The, the will of the people will not be broken. The, the Syrian people are very strong today. They're very dedicated to their cause. And whatever is happening, people are becoming, when, whenever a person, uh, uh, person uh, dies, people are going even stronger and in, uh, in larger numbers in the street. And I'm sure you've noticed when they first started, there were only a couple of hundreds, and then there were a couple of thousands, and they were in a, uh, one city, then it spread to two cities, then three, and now it's all over Syria. The demonstrations are taking place everywhere. Because as you know, nobody will accept when you have a cousin, a neighbor, a father, a son, a sister uh, who passed away. Nobody will accept that, and nobody is going to uh, go back home until this, uh, there's a regime change. Right. Let me go back to Syria and Iran. Um, if you are talking about isolating the Syrian regime, but we know that Iran will remain in many, many ways a lifeline for the, for the Bashar al-Assad uh, government. Um, how do we, as in the rest of the world, address that? And how, more importantly, how do you perceive Syrian-Iranian relationships in the post-Bashar Syria? Yeah. At the moment, uh, you know, the, uh, Iran is very uh, careful not to lose Syria because Syria for it is, is very important. If they lose Syria, they're isolated. You know, they won't be able to, to uh, uh, help uh, other extremist groups in the, in the area. They are not able to, to have control over Lebanon. They, were not, they, were, they wouldn't be able to have control over Gaza anymore or the western side of Iraq. So, they, uh, uh, so for, for them, they're just waiting for the right uh, uh, you know, occasion uh, to, for them to, to go in and, and help militarily or any other way to, to help Syria. Uh, at the same time, you have uh, countries in the, in the area. Uh, the problem is that they are, they are going into the trap. I mean, they are falling into the trap of the Iranians and the Syrian regime. Uh, and it's very unfortunate. A lot of uh, Arab media who are not, you know, uh, they are talking about uh, sectarian issues. They're taking this uh, fight into, uh, they're making it into a sectarian issue. I'm sure you've seen a lot of uh, countries, even in the Gulf, uh, you know, are, are talking about, for example, the, the media like Al Arabiya and the Sharq Al Awsat and others, they're all talking about, uh, you know, they're making uh, Alawites, Sunnis, uh, uh, a minority governing a majority, which is not true. First, first of all, this is not true uh, because uh, in Syria it's not a minority who's governing a majority. You know, in Syria there are few people in the regime who are from all sects and all uh, region. You have uh, uh, you know, uh, ministers, uh, you have a head, uh, you know, you have people, uh, officials who are, uh, you know, who are, uh, you have Alawites, but you have also Sunnis, uh, like the vice president is Sunni. Uh, you have a uh, head of uh, secret services in, in, uh, in, who was the head of, secret, uh, head of secret services in Lebanon, Rustam Wazali, who's a Druze, mm -hmm. and he's now responsible in, in Dara. You have Atif Najib, who's a Sunni, who was, who was the person who, who started the violence in Dara, actually, and he's a cousin of Bashar. Um, and you have Hassan Turkmani, who's also a Shia. So you have people from, you have specific uh, people. You have, uh, it's not the whole regime. It's not a sect who's controlling, uh, uh, you know, the, the Syrian, uh, I mean, the Syrian government. Uh, but on the other hand, those people are blaming it on a certain sect. They're saying, you know, everybody is calling on many uh, television channels, even one is, that is based in Egypt called the Safa television channel, calling on every day for a jihad against uh, the Alawites, uh, calling a jihad against an, uh, infidels, uh, which is uh, inappropriate. Is it, sorry, is, it, is, is that a Syrian channel that broke no, from uh, Egypt? No, it's uh, Saudi people, but it's based in Egypt. Okay. Saudi clerics and others. You also had a very f uh, famous uh, Saudi cleric, his, uh, uh, al Luhaydan, mm -hmm. uh, Yahya al Luhaydan, who also called last week, he was he's a very prominent figure in Saudi Arabia, calling on uh, a jihad against the infidels, the Alawites. 
well, this is again unacceptable. You know, because But, I mean, religion aside, if we're talking Syria, Iran, yeah, what is the future of the Syrian Iranian relationships? Well, this is very important. This is why I'm talking religion, because mm. as soon, uh, okay. you know, when you go into religion, when it becomes sectarian, you are, uh, the regime and Iran will, are getting closer and closer. You know, and at the end of the day, the same way, for example, it happened in Bahrain. You know, what happened in Bahrain, the, the, you know, uh, the, the regime in Bahrain asked uh, the Saudi government and uh, the Emirate government uh, and all the Gulf country uh, to come and to their rescue, to come and help them uh, against those demonstrators. Well, this is the same thing that's going to, again, it's the same exact thing that's going to happen in Syria. And if you remember, Walid Mu'allim, the foreign, uh, Syria's foreign minister, he visited Iran uh, at that time and he welcomed the, the Gulf countries intervening in Bahrain. But that was a signal saying that this, we, we are welcoming this happening in Bahrain, and, but if this happens in Syria, we will not hesitate asking uh, Iran for help. You know, so this is why we have to be very careful and try to, uh, not to fall into their trap uh, so that we won't give the excuse to Iran to intervene into the region. So a future, a future Syrian policy will be Iran-free? Yes, I hope so. Um, type one thing that we're addressing, there are also news um, today about Ben Ali being sentenced or being put to trial in, in, in Syria. Uh, pardon me. Uh, Tunis Tunis ben Ali in Tunisia. Um, he's being tried in, absen in absentia since his, his, he's currently is in Saudi Arabia. Um, whereas Hosni Mubarak is under um, what they politely say, house arrest, uh, try basically avoiding to put him personally in prison. So. If we're talking about justice and retribution, because the people of Syria have a lot of grievances against Bashar al-Assad and his friends, so should they, essentially, should Bashar al-Assad get the Ben Ali exit or the Mubarak exit? Should he be allowed to you know, leave the country and live happily ever after in a compound in Saudi Arabia, or should, should he be put to trial in, in Syria? Uh, there's two things. First of all, we are still giving uh, Bashar al-Assad a chance. You know, he has a golden opportunity today. Uh, to move towards democracy and freedom and, you know, and be the first person who was able to bring democracy to Syria. You still think he can? We are giving him a chance. I, I personally think that it's very difficult, you know, because there are people around him, from his family and people around him, who cannot see any change happening. Because any change would mean that they those people around him would lose their interests, and any change around him would mean that those people would be brought to justice. So those people would do anything possible to stay in power. And it's going to be very difficult for him. But at the end of the day, he has to, he's responsible because he's the president. He's the head of uh, the, the Ba'ath Party. Mm -hmm. He's the head of the army. At the end of the day, he's going to be blamed for everything. So he has to have the courage uh, and to come out and say, I tried my best for those 11 years. I wasn't able to do anything because those people around me are stopping me from, uh, you know, from uh, uh, moving forward. And I, you know, I'm joining my people against those uh, corrupt, you know, this corrupt gang or whatever you could call them. Uh, that's the only way I think we could move forward, even though it's, good, it's going to be dangerous for him. But at the end of the day, he has to have the courage to do it. Would the, would the people accept that, you think, after all of these deaths and detentions? I would they just forgive him and move on? I think up till today, people, uh, people are not sure. They're still asking him. They're giving him a last chance. And people are calling on him, even if you could see those... Uh, This, uh, on Facebook, the Syrian Revolution uh, page on Facebook, they are saying that we are, you know, we are giving you a last chance. We are going to give you a chance. You know? We're giving you six months to move uh, forward and change everything. But uh, until now, nothing has happened. Uh, I mean, we are hopeful. We cannot be anything but hopeful, because if not, as I said, it would, it's going to be a disaster. And uh, it's going to be a disaster in the whole region. So hopefully, let's wait a bit more, and, and hopefully things will change. So, so when, when you say giving him a last chance to turn things around, are you thinking that Bashar could remain in power for a while longer while fixing things? Because it's, my understanding is that people want him out and want him out now. So it seems to us, at least. Yes, but you think there's room for him to remain in power and fix things? No, no, to remain in power, that's of, cor of course not. He's going to remain okay. in power until the next elections, oh, okay. which will, he will have to call in like in six months or a year. 
okay. maximum, and then he will, you know, uh, that's it. And if he says, as he always says, you know, the people love him and he loved the bee, you know, then <laughs> if we have free uh, democratic elections, we'll see how much he is loved by the people. The democratic <laughs> elections is the way out. <laughs> I think so. Okay, and then on a personal note, um, if you're confident that the people's will will prevail and, and the revolution will end at some point in time, what do you see your role being in Syria? Would you go back? Would you try to assume a leadership role there? No, actually, I'm very, uh, you know, I was exiled when I was nine years old uh, from Syria. I just went back in, uh, shortly in, uh, you know, uh, to a short visit in 1994. Uh, the regime has, uh, at that time, tried to assassinate me uh, in the Damascus International Airport. Uh, so I left again, I went to Boston, I came back in uh, 97, and uh, I had to take care of our, our family's charity from 97 to 99, when my father left Syria again. Uh, and in 99, I left again to, to see my family in Spain, and the Syrian regime came and bombed at our house, I mean, uh, you know, with gunships, helicopters, everything, and uh, tanks. And, they bombed uh, your house. Yes, and uh, you know, at the time, we, I mean, it was uh, it was disaster because there, there wasn't any media around. Uh, uh, the official, the regime's official version was they attacked an illegal port belonging to uh, to our family. Even though, uh, thanks to fa to YouTube, later on we were able to put a video of uh, of showing that it's a house. You know, a few years later, showing that it was a house and how it uh, we show, we put video how, you know of the house after it got bombed. Uh, and I decided, you know, to, to that, uh, you know, uh, that this is uh, me being the, the nephew of President, the late President Assad at the time, and this is what, what me as a, you know, I, I have suffered from this regime. So could you imagine what those people could do to, to normal citizens in Syria, to the other citizens? I'm sure they, they will treat them, they will not hesitate to, to, uh, to do much, much worse. This is why whatever this is the official version of the regime today saying uh, things, uh, I, I don't believe any of it saying they are extremists or they are this. If, if they are extremists who are, who are doing, uh, attacking you know, civilians or who are killing uh, soldiers, why don't you allow the media to come into Syria and, and see for themselves? You know, and I'm sure the media will help you because nobody is really fond of extremism or, uh, you know, in, in the West. But again, uh, because they, they, you know, they, they don't want the, the truth to come out and uh, it's very unfortunate, and, but hopefully things will change very soon. So, so would you go back? Of course, I'll, I'll, I mean, it's my country. I would love to go back. Who doesn't love to, uh, who doesn't love to live his, in his own country and to see it becoming better and, you know, becoming part of the international community? But um, I just want to have, I mean, I just want to be uh, living, you know, free uh, in a democratic country. It's all what I, what I wish for in a peaceful country uh, where my uh, baby son could grow up and uh, it's all what I want. And would you want a leadership role in the, in the new government? No, really, I'm, I'm not interested in that. No. I love my freedom too much, I think. Too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I think we have about 15 minutes, I believe, for questions from, from the floor. Uh, I'm quite sure that there's a number of questions uh, everywhere. All right, let me start with um, the gentleman here, please. Uh, oh, sorry. Hello, my name is Juan Camilo Orques from Colombia, and I would like your opinion on the growing relationships between Iran and Venezuela and Bolivia and Ecuador, and this instability that has brought to the Latin American region. Yes. Well, uh, I, as I said before, you know, there are uh, those powers could be in, uh, I mean, dictators in uh, Latin America as. Uh, uh, as Chavez and, you know, and uh, the situation in Cuba. And, uh, all those dictators have same, the same interests. So they try to uh, stick together and to, uh, you know, uh, to try to face the, the, the free world. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, I mean, the relationship between Iran and, and Venezuela is, is not going to affect uh, much, you know, the, the, because they're... Uh, they're very far, you know, geopolitically, they're not next to, uh, you know, they're, they're very far from each other. And, uh, but what's scary about it is, is the help, uh, is what Iran could do in the Middle Eastern region. 
uh, not much in, in, uh, in Latin America. Uh, because in, uh, in the region, uh, Iran could have, have people is trying to use, for example, the Shia, uh, the Shia Arabs who are very sentimental and to tell them that we are, uh, that we are e here to help you to, uh, uh, to, to take your freedoms, to, to become, you know, to take the regime or, uh, from, you know, from the actual leaders now. But at the end of the day, there, uh, we have to know the true intentions of Iran, and the true intentions is, is just to uh, take control of the area by any, any mean possible. And they, they don't care, actually, about the Shia Arabs, because uh, you should see how they treat their own citizens. I mean, we also saw how the, during the Green Revolution in Iran, how the uh, Iranian regime treated their, their own citizens. I mean, they're Shia Iranians and Shia Arabs, and they, they, did, they did not hesitate into uh, killing, uh, killing them and torturing them and, uh, and doing the most horrible thing, uh, things to them. So why the, uh, the, the Shia Arabs uh, listen to the Iranians? Why do they have to believe the Iranians? They have to be very careful of their true intentions, and uh, you know, uh, and know how they treat them. You know how they treat their own people. So I'm sure if they treat the, they, their people this way, how are they going to treat them once they, they uh, you know, uh, once they're, those, uh, that they're able to take over the region? Thank you. Next question. Um, I think the gentleman in blue shirt here. I'm, I'm sorry, I keep sending you around with the mic. Uh, yes, there, thank you. Hello, my name's Andrew Radin, I'm from uh, MIT. I wanted to, to ask you about the um, legitimacy of Western involvement in these types of uh, democratic uprisings. Uh, you criticized any type of, of, of violent intervention, but you approved of sanctions. I guess I wonder uh, what type of, of involvement you think would be legitimate in Syria or in other uprisings, and, uh, and how the, the West can best help these countries. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, any sanctions that do not affect the Syrian citizens, you know, um, I, I welcome any sanctions that do not uh, affect the Syrian citizens and their daily lives, because uh, uh, any other sanctions than on officials would affect the Syrian people. I'm sure the leadership are not going to be uh, eating less or driving less cars or having, uh, you know, less, uh, uh, you know, uh, less fortunate lives if, if there are bigger sanctions uh, on the country. But I mean, all, uh, all sanctions that affect the Syrian uh, officials and the people around them, they are very welcome because those people... Uh, all of them have uh, their their money abroad, stashed abroad. They have, uh, you know, they they want to travel abroad. They don't want to be locked in Syria, and uh, and uh, you know they, they are very worried. I know personally that they are very worried about any uh, you know any uh, sanctions against them. And uh, this is very le legitimate. I think that uh, the international community should uh, support the Syrian people in every way possible, uh, and uh, this is a very, uh, very positive step that they, f they have taken until now. Hi. Um, behind Aaron, there's a gentleman over there. Sorry, where's the mic? Yes, thank you. Hello? Can you hear me? All right. Um, my name is Shmolek. I'm from Israel, so I obviously have a very personal vested interest in the kind of issues you're discussing and I'm perfectly sympathetic to the vast majority of the things that you say. I guess I wonder a bit though, coming up also with the other points raised so far, there seems to be a slight disjunction between two threads of the things that you're saying. So on the one hand we have a, <coughs> excuse me, on the one hand we have a very grim picture that you're giving of the regime, which I think most people in this room would see as a very realistic picture of basically atrocities. But on the other hand, you seem extremely reluctant to endorse any sort of aggressive intervention, especially by the West, against what's going on in Syria. And I wonder whether these two things really fit together. Because it seems to me that at the bottom, you're advocating some sort of almost Gandhi-like resistance to the regime, which might be perfectly noble. But I, I just wonder how feasible it is on the one hand. And on the other hand, if you look at a regime like Libya and what Gaddafi has been doing in Libya, 
I think most people in this room would not object to the kind of action that NATO, you know, the United States, for instance, has led. There is no doubt whatsoever that the United States, you know, could have stopped genocide in Rwanda in the 90s if kind of pictures you're drawing out in Syria could develop into such proportions. Why not? Why not step in? Yes, uh, the situation in Libya is a bit different than, uh, than in Syria. In Libya, uh, Gaddafi has used mercenaries from uh, Africa to come and uh, you know, uh, invite them to kill his own uh, people. So uh, this is why the Libyan people, uh, the uh, Libyan uh, revolutionaries, accepted the intervention of NATO. But trust me, if, uh, if Gaddafi was, uh, uh, you know, was, had not invited any mercenaries, uh, I don't think the Libyan people would have accepted any foreign involvement. Even, even with uh, Gaddafi inv inviting the mercenaries, still the Libyan people and the Libyan opposition and revolutionaries have not accept uh, accepted any uh, ground forces from uh, you know, the international community to come and help them. Because they are, that's the way the uh, Arabs are. They're very proud people and they think they'll be able to take care of it by themselves. And I'm sure if, they, if, uh, if there weren't any African mercenaries, the Libyan people would have already uh, uh, gotten rid of, of Gaddafi. But this, that's, uh, the, you know, that's, these are the facts. Sorry, I'm going to interject. Um, so if the Syrian people, if things got so bad that they actually wanted outside help uh, in military aid, would you get behind that because the Syrian people as, are asking for it? But the Syrian people, they, they, they will not ask for, uh, this is what I said, they will not ask for any uh, foreign intervention because they know how, uh, how bad it would go. But if they continue the way it, uh, they are, and if the army is able, you know, until now you have to see exactly how things evolved in Syria. Uh, they started with very peaceful demo demonstrations. You know. The Syrian regime couldn't take it anymore. They, had, they played every game possible. They, uh, they, uh, uh, you know, their secret services and security apparatus were uh, shooting at those demonstrators, were killing those uh, people. They were, uh, started blaming it. Uh, they had some elements of extremists, of course, which the Syrian secret services control, uh, that uh, they were sending to do like, uh, acts of violence against demonstrators. Uh, but they did not let the army intervene right away. Because they knew very well that the army at the end, you know, at the end of the day, the army is made up of people from, you know, from uh, uh, all sects and for all people in Syria. So uh, they started uh, using, you know, uh, the tactics of sending messages and uh, uh, they even started using the, um, you know, Facebook and, and others, you know, trying to show uh, how the extremists are attacking those civilians and how the people, the civilians, are the ones asking for the help of the army. And they kept this, for example, sending uh, SMS uh, to the Syrian television channels uh, saying uh, we would like the intervention of the army. You know, there were thousands of SMS every day on the Sy Syrian television channel. We all know that uh, any, uh, not one SMS could go on the Syrian television channel if it's not approved by the regime. So we know you could understand where the tactic is. So they wanted to show, to give, uh, to prepare a scenario that they are extremists that are coming, uh, attacking all those civilians. They are extremists backed by other countries and that came in, uh, infiltrated, uh, you know, uh, that came in from Jordan and other countries to uh, start an uprising, a milit uh, you know, uh, an armed uprising against the regime. And only at the end, you know, when they were able to get to that point, they called into the army, like the army we need, like saying the army is, uh, are the people that could get rid of those extremists. But if, they continue, if people don't uh, stop and they continue on demonstrating peacefully, at the end of the day, the army and anyone else would not accept to shoot their own people. I mean, who's going to be faced to, uh, with his brother or his cousin or his uh, father or his mother? You know, how, how could they be faced in, in shooting their own people? This is impossible. No, you're I, facing I your own cousin. <laughs> Sorry? You're facing your own cousin, though. Yes, but I'm not, sh I'm not shooting at him. <laughs> and I, I, will, I, will not, I will always Sorry. refuse to, to, to carry arms against anybody. In, uh... okay. Pardon me, I will be the undiplomatic moderator and reformulate that question. Is there any point where you believe intervention will be necessary in Syria? Or is it none, never? M military intervention? Yes, foreign intervention. I think it's, it's the worst thing that could happen because so it would not no. stop. I think it would be the start of a regional war and we all know it, and this is what the regime wants, this is what Iran wants, and this is what all other groups, Hezbollah, Hamas, they all want that. Okay, so that's so a categorical that's, no. that's categorical, you know, impossible. Thank you.
All right, let me move shift to that side of the room, perhaps. Uh, any further questions? There's one there. Sama, over there. I can't see anything. Yes, I have, uh, yes, the, the, the lady in the scarf. And um. then the gentleman behind her. Thank you um, for your insights and um, your courage to step up. I was just wondering, are you a, a lone soldier in this pursuit or are there others in the regime and indeed the family who are supporting your position and line, albeit covertly? And what is the likely scenario for Syria in the coming months? I mean, what is likely to happen? We're seeing you know, refugees fleeing now to the North Lebanese border. Um, we've just touched upon the issue of intervention. What, what's likely to happen? Yes, thank you. Uh, well, actually, no, we have, uh, as you know, we, uh, you know, we have a lot of support in, in Syria. My father has a lot of support in Syria, in the army, uh, you know, in the educated people, in, uh, you know, between the Christians, the Alawites, the Druze, uh, all, uh, you know, all part of society. Uh, of course, but the extremists, which they are enemies, and, and we have to admit that because we, uh, we are not very fond of extremism and anywhere. Uh, and we will continue to challenge everywhere. Um, and uh, also, if you, have, uh, uh, if you have noticed lately on uh, the Syrian television channel, and uh, there's stooges around, uh, like Al Dunya television channel, uh, Al Manar, which belongs to Hezbollah, they all have been blaming uh, me for being uh, behind those uh, demonstrations happening in Syria. Uh, and they have all been saying that I'm actually, uh, I'm in Lebanon now, uh, sitting in the town of Tripoli and uh, directing all those operations from the town of Tripoli in northern Lebanon. Obviously. Uh, obviously, I'm, you know, uh, we have very nice studios in Lebanon now. But, um, and th that's to show you because they're trying, uh, they're still trying to, mal uh, to, to tell the people in, in Syria that if you are waiting for, uh, you know, for these people to come and, and save you, well, this, you know, these are the people that are arming those extremists and are, you know, are the ones leading those uh, killings uh, against you. Uh, so now we are uh, actually in a, um, in a media war with, uh, with the regime uh, because we're trying to show that uh, in every way possible that they're, uh, that, you know, to discredit them, you know, that they are liars. Uh, for example, um, uh, I have just... Uh, 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 you know, uh, sued uh, Al Manar television channel and the uh, member of, uh, you know, the ex-member of parliament, uh, a Lebanese member of parliament, Nasser Kandil, for spreading those, uh, those false uh, rumors on television and everywhere. Uh, well, this would show, uh, again, uh, this would discredit the Syrian regime in front of the Syrian people, and uh, that would let we receive messages on Facebook on, on, uh, and a lot of, uh, you know, my emails and, uh, th you know, through people that come to Lebanon and, and call our organizations uh, and tell us that this is, that we are supporting you, we are with you, and, uh, but please, we, uh, you know, uh, make us understand, tell us the truth, what, what is really happening, you know, are you the one uh, behind what is happening, uh, the regime is trying to blame you for this, the regime is saying that you are the one behind the killings of, of uh, civilians uh, in Syria today. Uh, so we have to discredit them first uh, before we could, uh, you know, uh, move uh, forward because we have to make sh to tell the, uh, the entire Syrian population that uh, the Syrian regime is lying to you, uh, uh, you know, they will do whatever possible, uh, you know, to stay in power. They are ready to kill anybody who opposes them and uh, uh, including their own family. Uh, we have a lot of people in, uh, for example, uh, that, that are Alawites in the Latakia region and others who, are, who have been blamed by, uh, by some Syrian opposition for, being, for going and taking part in those, uh, you know, in clamping down on the, the repressing the demonstrators, those peaceful demonstrators, which is, again, is not true. And we have to show the people that these are members of the secret services and not uh, members of the Assad family. Uh, we have distant cousins who are also uh, from the Assad family who were, the, you know, heard the most by the, Syri by, by the Syrian regime. Uh, and uh, this is uh, something that I would like everybody here to know. When uh, Bashar came to power in 2000, he called every distant cousin of his from the Assad family and he put them in jail. Uh, you know, uh, f they were all uh, put in jail from, uh, and sentenced from two to four years. And uh, so believe me, none of, none of even the Assad family who are in Syria is with the Syrian regime. So if his own family is not with him, so could you imagine about the other, uh, you know, the, 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 the other Syrian, the, you know, the, what's remaining of the Syrian people, the remaining Syrian people. 
Right. Uh, I believe Dominic is allowing me to sneak in one extra final very brief question and brief answer. Um, but if, before I take a question, are there any Syrians by any chance who would like to ask a question to Rebel? Yes? No? No. Uh, sir, please. Yes, please. You're not Syrian, are you? <laughs> Thank you. I'll, I'll ask you to kindly keep it brief, and I will ask for about to do the same, if possible. Thank you very much. Hello. Yes, works. Okay, thank you. <coughs> uh, my name is Yao Qi from Shanghai, China. I'm studying Shanghai Jiao Tong University. And my question is, in Arab countries, uh, I think the radical Muslim groups are very important and have great influence on your countries and uh, the citizens in there, right? Since they have so much uh, great uh, influence, whether can a stable democratic, democratic institution exist without observing these Muslim groups? And if, uh, if you agree with that, how can, can you uh, create a built a stable in, uh, institution uh, uh, while you observing these groups? I mean, I, I mean, you. Uh, why are you say uh, human rights, uh, democracy, something like that? That seems you have an attitude to against these groups, right? If if you uh, insist uh, doing these these things, I think these uh, these Muslim groups will be against against to your uh, uh, movement. So so how can how can you uh, change this situation? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, you have to know something. You know, uh, people in general in the uh, you know uh, in the Middle East or in the Arab world, Muslims are not extremists. Uh, people uh, become extremists uh, because of I mean because of uh, dictatorship. Because when there is a dictatorship and uh, people have no hopes in their future, you know, uh, when people cannot complain about what's happening to them, when people cannot say. Uh, we are hungry, or uh, this person in, in the government is corrupt, uh, what do they do? Those people tend to go to uh, find themselves in mosques and uh, you know, uh, asking for God's help. And this is where you find a lot of people in, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, I mean, extremist uh, imams or other in, in, you know, waiting to recruit those people and to tell them that, you know, uh, uh, you know the only way for you to, uh, is to, you know, to, to join God and to, to uh, uh, you know, to become more extremist. This is an infidel regime, and we have to fight them, and we have to, uh, you know, and if you die doing that cause, you will go to paradise, and uh, you will have a palace in paradise, and all of this. And the problem is that if that person doesn't have any hope on earth, so, you know, uh, at the end of the day, he, he, he's looking for hope, uh, you know, for somewhere else. And this was the sad thing about it. This is why we, are, we want democracy today, and it's very important that we, we have democracy. In, in the 50s, they, for example, we used to, uh, there used to be a kind of democracy in Syria, and the Muslim Brotherhood did exist at that time, but they didn't have more than uh, two seats in parliament. So uh, the Arab people in general, when they have something to look uh, up to, uh, and uh, something that uh, uh, you know, they, they, uh, they look forward to, they, they're not, certainly not, they, don't, they wouldn't have time even to go and, uh, and r become radicalized. You know, this is the last thing that people want. Uh, I mean, you have a lot of uh, people, I mean, uh, Muslims who live in the West, and, uh, uh, you know, and, and they're not, you know, they, they have to go to, you know, to their daily lives. They have to support their children, their family. They have to wake up to go to work. They have, uh, uh, you know, to pay for, uh, for their car, for their house, for other things. So people are not uh, really looking to, uh, to that. The only, uh, the only thing that makes people uh, radicalized are those dictatorship regimes, and this is why we have to get rid of them as soon as possible.